everybody. Welcome to Topic 6 of Unit 3. You know, when you're talking about when it matters most in terms of sports and international affairs, it'd be very remiss not to have a topic about the Olympics and the Cold War. So the Cold War was fraught with difficulties for the entire world because either you're in the first world, which is the U.S. and its allies, or in the first world. The second world was the Soviets and their sphere of influence, or the third world, which now comes to mean sort of an underdeveloped country, but was in fact people who were neither aligned with the United States nor aligned with the Soviet Union. That was the concept of the third world. They wanted to be sort of distinct from those two, but they got caught up into all sorts of uh, shenanigans, you might say, in terms of how geopolitics worked, how uh, economics worked, how uh, trade embargoes and uh, issues at the UN and even issues in sports worked. And uh, you couldn't really escape it no matter who you were, uh, whether you were a sports fan or not, but certainly as a sports fan, it devolved into the Olympics in uh, significant ways. Now, at the time, the Olympics happened uh, every four years, and there were two Olympics every four years. So this would go all the way through the Cold War, right? The Cold War basically ends roughly in 1990. So until 1990, you had the Summer Olympics and the Winter Olympics held in the same year. Uh, it was only in 1992 when you started to go to that off schedule, where, um, so in 92 was the last time you had both Olympics in the same year. Then you went to uh, um, 94 with the Winter Games, 96 with the Summer Games, 98 with the Winter Games, 90, 2000 with the Summer Games, etc. So that it used to happen twice every four years, and uh, this was uh, part and parcel of, of the Olympics and the Cold War. I looked a little bit about uh, medal tables and how the Soviets and the folks there and their allied groups did in that last unit, but let's look at some of this now as we go forward. Now, Technically speaking, if you read the UN, the IOC Charter, and my students in international studies know I like to read charters and and uh, um, constitutions and things like that to see what exactly the institution is supposed to be doing. The IOC Charter specifically says that Olympic Games are competitions between athletes in individual or team events, not between countries. So technically speaking, you shouldn't have any sort of political issues going on during the Cold War, even today, because it's individuals competing, not countries. Now, obviously, that's problematic because even the Bahamian uh, team, which is the team from the Bahamas here, uh, track team uh, on the right at the Beijing Olympics, and there on the left is the Athletes' Village there where they live together with other athletes. Okay, so yes, they are there as individuals or a team member from the Bahamas, but they walk into the stadium behind their national flag, which screws up this whole idea from Chapter 6, Article 1 very fast, that they are competitions between individuals or teams, not countries. So officially, IOC Charter would say there was no competition in the Cold War, but obviously there was. Let's, let's say that there were just individuals. You know, the Cold War went through different periods uh, in the various decades of the 20th century. In the 1950s was particularly problematic in the United States because you had the Red Scare and you had Senator McCarthy from Wisconsin investigating everybody for uh, un-American activities. And one of the things that could get you cast as uh, un-American was to actually express any sort of admiration for anything that the Soviet Union or any other communist state was doing. So when you looked at athletes, you had to sort of be careful and say, is this a safe place? Can I express admiration for that person as an athlete? Will I get in trouble if I do? And there was actually an ability to express admiration. So we talked about safe aggression in past units. In this case, in the Cold War, there was a place of safe admiration. You could admire an athlete, a runner, a weightlifter, a basketball player, a hockey player, a skier, etc., who was from a communist state without getting yourself uh, a foul of the uh, Committee on Un-American Activities that Senator MacArthur uh, ran. So you, you had to be uh, uh, pretty careful, except in sports, where you can have safe admiration. It's, it's actually uh, a warm spot in the Cold War, where uh, a lot of times you could do that with athletics. It didn't work all the time, but it worked sometimes. Um, we in the United States, we were not always interested in the full medal table. One of the reasons we weren't always interested in the full medal table is we didn't win the full medal table all the time. So one of the things you'll find is that um, boy, back when we first looked at the medal table for the introductory activity for this class, if you looked at the top of the table, there were, depending on whose table you looked at, different countries were ranked first. Some countries rank themselves according to how many gold medals they won. And some countries rank themselves on the number of medals total they won, which could be a different country at the top, or in fifth, or in tenth, or whatever. So if you won uh, 50 gold medals and no other medals, and someone else won 75 uh, medals, and they won 49 golds and uh, 26 of others, then some states would say that the 50 medals with no others was first in the medal table, and some would say the one with 49 golds and 26 others was first. So the United States, uh, we wouldn't sort of pitch either one of those a lot during the Cold War. We became interested in fastest, strongest, best. So how did we do in these instances? So we didn't say 
worry about whether we were winning medals in the yachting events or the judo events or something like that. They sort of said, let's let those other states worry about those. We'll worry about fastest, strongest, best. And fastest, we did pretty good. So we got sort of written here, Warsaw Pact, which would be the Soviets and their allies, and NATO, which would be the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, right? That IGO we looked at way back in Unit 1. Who won what medals in what events? Who won the gold? Who was fastest? And we were really good at fastest from 52, which was the first year that the uh, Soviets competed all the way through 88, which is the last year they competed. So the 100 meter dash, NATO or its allies won over and over again. Then in strongest, we didn't fare so well. They were very good at strongest. And you'll remember that picture uh, from the last topic, uh, or two topics ago, where we looked at uh, the the uh, Soviet uh, athletes in, in weightlifting and see, you know, maybe you don't do well against him. Gymnastics was in two parts. So we did best in two parts. The first best uh, that a lot of people looked at was women's gymnastics and the team performance. So we won one gold medal in the whole era in 1984 in women's all around. So that was uh, a sing individual woman won a medal. That was uh, Mary Lou Retton in 1984. But other than that, uh, uh, gymnastics teams from the USSR or from Romania won all women's gymnastics competitions through the entire Cold War. And a lot of the things they put the all around, which had all those different events in them, they would say those were the best. Uh, we, though, had a different measure for best. So our best that we measured was the decathlon. So those would be the 10 events uh, uh, that men would compete in track and field and to see who could be the, the, the best of the winner. So we won the majority of those. And the Soviets, uh, I can't remember who won in 72 or 88. It was one of their athletes or just one of their allies. Uh, but look at all these people we had. So this is Bob Mathias in the top corner throwing the discus. Uh, Milt Campbell below him. Uh, Rayford Johnson's here in the middle. Uh, Bill Toomey uh, here, and then uh, Bruce Jenner or Caitlyn Jenner, uh, depending on uh, when you're listening to this, uh, as decathlon winners. And I remember this very well because this would be us, the United States, pitching who is the best of the best. And so when we would have the best athlete, that would sort of denote a win for us that would uh, supersede any sort of conversation about the medal table. Uh, whether that plays into reality or not doesn't matter. That was how the popular perception was, is who was fastest, strongest, best. And we tended to be fastest, and we tended, in our own estimation, to be best. They tended to be strongest, and in their own estimation, best, because of the gymnastics there. And then you could always define the medal table however you wanted to, to do so. There's a couple of times when you had really interesting uh, competitions that came up that sort of supersede all other things. And this is a very interesting set of pictures. This is from the gold medal basketball game between the USA in 1972 and the USSR also in 1972 also. So this is uh, the United States celebrating its gold medal victory here on the left and this is the Soviets scoring the basket that won them the gold medal on the right. And yes you heard that correctly both of them are celebrating a gold medal championship. Uh, this is one where there were three ends to the game. Two ends of the game saw the United States win. The third and final end of the game saw the Soviets win. The Soviets won the the medal, the gold medal. The United States did not. This was a shocking sort of moment for the United States. A couple of things going on here. It's not just the basketball competition and basketball being something we sort of perceive as our sport, right? It's in our sports space. It's invented in the United States, uh, and uh, some people will think maybe it was invented in Canada. But anyway, I don't want to get in trouble for any Canadians who might be taking the class. But we'll call it invented in the United States. Anyway, uh, our sport, our win, our college players against their quote-unquote amateurs who happen to be in the military who are basically full-time basketball players. So when it, it gets reversed, the results, and we lose, it's kind of a shocking moment. And we'll, uh, there's, there's a bonus bit for you to watch about basketball in 1972 here. So that's one of those things where basketball uh, matters. The other would be the 1980 hockey game, the Miracle on Ice game. And this is one of those things where you could have done the whole unit on when it matters most uh, just on this one. Because, yes, you've got Cold War, so it matters most then. You're also talking about legitimacy and rehabilitation. That's not one we really emphasize in here. I mean, I mentioned it a few times when we looked at the Japanese women winning the 2011 Women's World Cup title, and that happening at the backdrop of the Fukushima nuclear disasters and the devastating earthquakes that happened in 2011. And they, they needed a win. They needed something, some big positive news to come to them. 1980, uh, uh, the... Uh, winter of 1980 was a pretty rough one in the United States where we had the hostages in Iran, right? We mentioned that one a, a couple of units ago. We had a uh, spiraling economy, spiraling down, inflation going up, uh, interest rates really high. Uh, we had a really rough time with our own national psyche. And the w victory of our amateur hockey players over the Soviet team in 1980, this miracle and ice moment, 
matters. And it is superseded, super transcended. I mean, this actually wasn't even the gold medal game. The gold medal game was the next game, uh, and no one really remembers it because it isn't the same charged matchup because it wasn't the Cold War opponent. But hockey matters, and yes, and uh, away we go there. There was an attempt to have an alternative to the Olympic Games because there was so much pressure from the Cold War and from other things. We'll look in the final piece of the unit about boycotts. And it wasn't just the Cold War boycotts. There were others that, that went on. But there was so much politics that went on, even though officially there weren't supposed to be, that there was an attempt to try something different, an alternative to the Olympics. And Ted Turner, who was a, um, a media mogul in the United States, um, he founded something called the Goodwill Games, which were supposed to transcend politics. And his idea was that once he would hold it in and the Soviet bloc, then the next one you'd hold it in uh, the NATO bloc. And so the first one was in Moscow. The second one was in Seattle. Um, and you're trying to have these games together with people who are competing just for the love of sport. And it was a great, nice sort of idea uh, that falls apart very quickly because the sponsorship dollars don't come and uh, and there's just not sort of an, an appetite for another major global sporting event on the scene. Uh, so it doesn't work. But it was an idea, an alternative that's supposed to transcend politics. It also, he introduces it at the very end of the Cold War. Uh, and so once you get past 1990, there's not the same sort of need for the Goodwill Games uh, that, uh, that, uh, that going forward. So what does this all mean? Well, the Olympics were always part of the larger Cold War narrative, always. And depending on what you wanted to show, right, if they wanted to show that they won, they could show that. If we want to show that we won, we could show that. If you want to show that the athletes won or it tied or some other thing happened, you could show all of that sort of thing because the medal table and results in different events lets you do that. And because there was no official statement from the Olympics, the IOC that says this country won or that country won, uh, overall, you, you couldn't tell. Just the medal table and different victories, fastest, strongest, best, and the like. And where I really want to end today is with this slide right here. Forget the Cold War, right? We won the decathlon in 1996. The University of Idaho won the decathlon with uh, alumni Dan O'Brien taking the honor in 96. So that actually means that uh, the USSR did have one winner, uh, either 72 or 88, and we had a winner in 1996. Uh, so you can suck at Soviet Union. We, we tied you, uh, just the University of Idaho. Forget the whole United States. Uh, and go Vandals.